everybody. Special welcome if you're visiting the church today. Uh, my name's Graham and I am the senior pastor here at Ranui. So, ma lo la lei, talofa lava, kirana, buenos dias, minglaba, hula, and bonjour. <laughs> so today's the last uh, message from uh, the series our Inspire series, and we've looked at the courage 
of Esther. We looked at Nehemiah and how he faced and how he overcame opposition. We looked at Daniel, who had a very disciplined spiritual life way before he faced the lion's den. And last week, we looked at Rahab, a woman that once she had given her life to God, she immediately put her faith into action and God blessed her and turned her life completely around. Today, we're going to look at the book of Habakkuk and see what happened as he wrestled with God. Now, I think this short book is one of the most neglected but relevant books of our day. It's named after the prophet Habakkuk who wrote it, after his interactions with God. It's a short book, but it stands apart from all other prophetic works. It's a kind of reverse of what we know about Old Testament prophets. So most of the Old Testament prophets spoke God's word to the people. Habakkuk actually brings the people's word to God. And that's what makes it stand apart. And I think as we get into this this morning, I just need to explain a little bit about the historical background and that was going on because I think it's critical for understanding this book. So Habakkuk lived during very difficult times. Huge upheaval, political change, violence. During his time, Judah was invaded. The destruction of Jerusalem took place placed by the Babylonians. And these were the years of King Josiah. And Josiah was an incredibly righteous king. He brought the nation to repentance. He restored the law of God, and he drove out idolatry and pagan practices. But unfortunately, those were the good old days, because then he died. And Habakkuk comes onto the scene right at the end of those days. And Josiah's son, Jehoiakim, comes onto the throne. And unfortunately, he did not inherit any of his father's virtues. He's been described as one of the most decadent, evil, violent men that has ever held political power in the Bible. Certainly one of the most evil leaders, certainly in Judah's history. He restored pagan worship, He abandoned the law of God, but his real mark of notoriety was this. He had the audacity to put a prophet of God to death. So that tells you something about him. So apart from this political world crumbling around him, Habakkuk suffered from a culture of blatant immorality and paganism. He saw the invasion of his home, the destruction of Jerusalem, the decay of society. And this time in Israel and Judah's history was so dark that God sent many prophets to the people during this time. The time of Habakkuk was also the time of Nahum and Zephaniah and Jeremiah. All of these prophets were contemporaries of each other. We don't know much about Habakkuk, don't know about his lineage or family details, I mean, obviously we know his name and that he was a prophet from the text itself. But you're going to see that he was very authentic with God, almost, to be honest with you, uncomfortably so. And his name means to wrestle. And we're going to find out as we go through this book that he did both of those things. He starts by wrestling with God, and then he embraces God with faith. And while today sometimes his writings are overlooked, people in the past did not overlook his writings. Considered one of the crucial books of the Old Testament. It is quoted three separate times in the New Testament, in Romans, in Galatians, and in Hebrews. He was respected. So with all that in mind, let's look at his first complaint to God. Can I have the PowerPoint up, guys? Is it up? Oh, it is. Sorry. Okay. So chapter chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. How long, Lord, 
must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abound. Therefore, the Lord is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked him in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Wow. This is a serious complaint that he voices straight to God. And if you notice, he didn't pull any punches. I think he'd probably been voicing concerns to God for a while, but he gets to a point, and if we're honest, sometimes we do too, where it just totally overwhelms him. And so he cries out, and literally cries out, I mean. In verse 2, the words cry out, in the original Hebrew, are better translated this, I screamed. He could not contain himself anymore, so he shouted out with this emotional intensity. That's where he had got to, where you kind of just reach your breaking point. You know, in all my years of pastoral work, I've noticed that people react differently to these kind of challenges. Some weep and sob uncontrollably when they reach this point. Others become very quiet and angry. Well, for Habakkuk, he screamed out at God. He was overrun with emotional pain. And he lays out his feelings and concern. And in this text, there's two kind of key phrases that I want to just highlight. He says, how long and why? How long and why? How long is this going to go on? How long am I going to have to suffer? How long will I have to endure? How long will I hurt? God, how long? Because I don't think he probably could have gone on much longer. And then he says, why? Why did this happen to me? Why aren't you coming to my rescue? And these weren't questions of some fault-finding negative critique on the theology of God. This was personal. They're the real searchings of an honest person. And I think for Habakkuk, violence was the final problem. It's a key word for him, and he refers to it six times in his book. And it wasn't just physical violence. He's using that term in a really broad way. So what he's saying is there's relational violence, there's legal violence, there's economic violence. Any way you can do violence to someone. In other words, any way you can wound someone or ambush someone or hurt someone. And in verse 3, he's clear on how some of this was happening. Injustice. He mentions wrongs and destruction and strife and conflict. So Habakkuk turns to God and he says, How long? And God, I need to know why. Why is this happening? But that wasn't even the worst. The worst was in verse 4. Habakkuk says to God, Let me tell you where your inaction and your inability to deal with violence has left us. Your law's paralyzed. Justice never prevails. The wicked him and the righteous and justice is perverted. He was saying, God, your law no longer exists, not in the courtrooms, not in the business, not particularly in how the poor are treated. They're being ripped off. We need that divine Lord. We need need you to come back and protect us. We need a just God and a just judge. And... Habakkuk says, you know what? That divine intention, intervention that we're crying out for, it didn't come. The wicked encircle him. The wicked outnumber the righteous. God, how can you tolerate this and not act? No one's standing up against this. So what does Habakkuk do with all of this? 
I think the first thing to note is he takes it straight to God. And he asks, why haven't you done something? How long must I call for help and you don't listen? And he gets very personal in verse 3. Why do you make me see all this? <laughs> you know, God can give wonderful blessings and goodness. And he alone has the power to do it. To intervention. And here's the key thing. In the Bible, people who sought God's blessing left the kind of blessing up to God. So Habakkuk isn't running away from his faith. And I think this is important for us to realize. He's running to it. He bundles it all up and he takes it directly to God. And because of this, God is going to use this entire process so that the prophet can receive his word. And we all see that Habakkuk, well, God didn't blast him. He said, fair enough. Thanks for coming to me. Let's talk about this. And I think sometimes we'll go anywhere with our questions about God apart from to God. We take our complaints and our concerns sometimes to the wrong places. We can talk about God rather than to God. We complain about God rather than to him. Well, not Habakkuk. Neither did Moses or David or Jeremiah. Neither did Job or any other biblical character, actually. Habakkuk reminds us, you know what? It's okay to be real with God. He can handle that, to be honest in our prayers, to do what the Bible says and take all of our burdens to him. And we're going to see through Habakkuk that God is actually willing to hear our concerns and to help us deal with our issues. And he'll teach us how to ask the hard questions. There's no problem about that, but all within the context and safety of our faith in him. And so, God answers. Oh, wrong way, sorry. I think that's the right one. Yeah, so this is God's answer to his complaint. Look at the nations and watch. Be utterly amazed. For I'm doing something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people, who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like a vulture swooping to devour. They all come bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They deride kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities. They build earthen ramps and capture them. Then they sweep past like the, the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own strength is their God. Wow. This is not what Habakkuk had in mind. It's not what he wanted to hear God say. I mean, God, you're right. Things are an absolute mess. And he says, I'm going to raise up your worst enemy, the Babylonian army, and I'm going to bring them to power. They're going to ravage your land. And that's exactly what happened. They invaded Judah. They destroyed Jerusalem. And they destroyed the temple. And they sent that entire nation off into exile. This is not what Habakkuk wanted or expected. What he wanted was an explanation. And he wanted God to kind of respond graciously. He wanted a restored nation under God. Instead, God says, I'm going to send the Babylonians and they're going to destroy your land. You see, God had warned these people over and over and over, but they wouldn't listen. He sent them prophet after prophet. They still wouldn't listen. So eventually, the long-suffering God was now going to act. Habakkuk complained about the state of the world, the evil and justice, and God was going to act. He was going to bring judgment. Well, as you can imagine, that's not exactly what Habakkuk was hoping for. He has serious concerns, so back to God he goes. I 
O Lord, he says, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, we will not die. O Lord, you have appointed them to execute judgment. O rock, you have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up these more righteous than themselves? You have made men like fish in the sea, like sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet, and he rejoices and he is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and burns incense, incense to his dragnet. For by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? And then in Habakkuk 2 verse 1, the prophet says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. So there's a few lessons here, I think. Habakkuk, and I want to say it again and again, he goes to God first. And sometimes it's our tendency when we're faced with a crisis or an event to exhaust all other resources and then we'll pray. Before we go to God. Don't don't miss this because it's really important. Because of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, we can go directly to God. He wants to dialogue. He's not afraid to debate with us. And the prophet, he's trying to figure out this God who he's given his life to. And he goes to God for the figuring out bit. And he says, how can you, a holy God, use wicked people to punish us? I know the situation is bad, And I've called you to act. But the Babylonians, they're the worst of the worst. How can a holy God use an unholy nation? God, what are you thinking? How could you do this? Yes, we need your judgment. But let's be frank, in comparison, they're 10 times worse than us. If you're going to dish out judgment, how about starting with them? You know, God can use evil intentions and the actions of others for ultimate good. A writer playing with this idea called it a kind of sinful judo. I like that. Redirecting evil intentions as they come to the world for good. And the point is, God does evil, does allow, sorry, does allow evil and Satan to operate. And yet he still achieves his purposes. Satan must have thought that during the crucifixion, he was doing his worst. He must have thought, I've won. I've won. I've killed the Son of God. But all along, God knew how this was going to work out. Imagine what Satan must have realized that he hadn't won anything. (laughs) He hadn't defeated the Son of God. That out of that terrible torture and suffering that Jesus went through, we now have a way back to God. If we believe in him, we can have eternal life. So let's see the next part. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks to the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay and will not delay. See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous will live by his faith. Indeed, why betrays him? He is arrogant and never at rest. Because he is greedy as the grave, like death is never satisfied. He gathers himself to all the nations and takes captive of all the peoples. So God wanted to make sure that Habakkuk wrote this down. And he obviously wrote all these interactions with God down. But here particularly, God says, don't lose this because I want everyone to hear this word. This is going to happen. And you're going to have to get 
ready and you're going to need faith. Everyone needs to know what is going to happen so that they can face it with faith. So God wants his words down on tablets. He kind of, I suppose in modern terms, emailed to everybody in Habakkuk's address book. The Babylonians are going to invade, but that's not the last chapter of the story. And I love in verse 4, how God's response. See, he's puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous will live by his faith. Indeed, wine betray him. He's arrogant and never at rest. Because he is greedy as the grave and like death is never satisfied, he gathers himself all the nations and takes captive all the peoples. So here's God's indictment on the Babylonians. Yes, he's going to use them, but he wants Habakkuk and everyone to know that he knows what they're like. And he will deal with them. And the interesting thing about God's indictment on them is how he points out five areas of them. So here's the specific judgment against Babylon. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord Amen. as the waters cover the sea. I love that verse. Yes. <laughs> Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors, pouring it from the wineskin till they are drunk so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. You'll be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it is your turn. Drink and be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you and disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you have done to Lebanon will overwhelm you and your destruction of animals will terrify you for you have shed man's blood. You've destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Of what value is an idol since a man has carved it or an image that teaches lies? For he who trusts in his own creation he makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to this piece of wood, come to life or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver, but there is no breath in it. So God points out some five things about these people, greed, injustice, violence, seduction, and idolatry. And they really reveal the heart of the sin of Babylon. And he's saying to the prophet, you know, I know about their depravity. And although I'm going to use them, they too are going to be punished. But of course, Habakkuk really wants something else, a different order. But God has this different timeline. We see this much, he sees this much. He gets to decide how judgment comes. And understand, he says, that it's going to come in the end. Make sure the people know this. And then let's look at the very, at this couple of verses here. So verse 20. But the Lord it is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. I love this as, a, you know, the last kind of verse or one of them. Let me tell you why. Habakkuk complains to God about the condition of his world. And God answers, said, yep, I see it, and I'm going to deal with it. And Habakkuk says, you know, I don't like how God, you know, how you're going to do it. You can't use the Babylonians instead of judging them first. And God answers back, he's well aware of the sin of the Babylonians, and they're going to get what's coming to them. But those who are righteous are going to have to wait this out patiently for God's justice to play out and never lose their faith. It's their faith that will see them through. And God says, okay, Habakkuk, you've talked and I've talked and now there's one last thing I want to say to you. But the Lord it is in his, in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. He says, I'm God. I've spoken. I'm on my throne it's now time to be silent and accept what I've said. 
There's a time to come to God with our questions and our ravings and our rantings and our shaking of our fists. And God's big enough for all of that. But there comes a time to stop, to stop searching, to stop striving for an explanation to every little thing in our lives. And there's a time to be silent before the presence of the living God and to be overwhelmed by God's glory. So how does this ongoing kind of dialogue end? Quite dramatically. So here at the end of the conversation, no more questions, no more complaints, no more concerns, following God's second reply. And Habakkuk falls on his knees and prays. And that's how the great book of Habakkuk finishes. And no matter the conversation you're having with God right now, or what's going on in your life, we learn how these things are supposed to end. It should end in prayer, on our knees before the living God. Specifically, as it does here, a prayer of worship. We get a hint from the strange phrase, instruction for the worship leaders, a musical term of some sort, but we don't know exactly what. But we do know that this prayer was probably used for worship. And then... In verse, chapter 3, verse 2, Habakkuk says, Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember your mercy. And if you read that chapter 3, I don't have time to kind of go through it, but it begins with this great acknowledgement of God's greatness in the past. And God says you have to be patient and faithful in times of what's coming. And God, your track record, Habakkuk says, is without blemish. You've proven yourself to be faithful over and over throughout time. And if you read that chapter, he just kind of goes through all the things that God has done. And he's, I've got confidence in you to make yourself known. And I think in some ways for Habakkuk, that was the heart of worship, a sense of submission to God's agenda. His ways, even like Habakkuk, we may not like the answers, but we have a choice to align ourselves with what he wants. And then in chapter three, as I've said, he hits the kind of scroll button about who God is and how he's acted and the people of Israel's experience with their God. A warrior God, a just God, a God who defends his people, Habakkuk has written a moment of worship. So no matter what happens to them, he's reminding them that this is the guy that God they can rely on. And this final prayer is really personal. Oh, wrong line. Habakkuk 3, 16 to 19. And this is the last part. This is what he says in praise. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. He's terrified of what's coming. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. And though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer, and he enables me to go on the heights for the director of music on stringed instruments. As I studied this book, this kind of really gripped me. And I think it's something we can take hold of for all of our lives. If you knew in advance, like Habakkuk does, that your life in Christ was going to be hard, it was going to be full of, full of suffering and hardship, would you turn around and praise him? Write a worship song about him? Well, that's what Habakkuk did. And I'm in awe of him. He knew exactly what was coming. The terror that he and Judah faced with these coming Babylonians. 
And if you knew all that, would your response be to say, yeah, I'm scared, but I'm going to say what an incredible God you are. And at the end of the day, I accept that. Whatever you say, because your God goes. And I'm going to order my life around you no matter what happens. I'm going to have confidence in you, and I'm going to hope that justice will eventually prevail. Because I know you, and I trust you. Let me pray. Father, it's been good to have uh, this series looking at these amazing stories of courage and faith and spiritual discipline. And Oh, man, it's been great. And your word offers so much for us, your love, your grace, your truth, your compassion, and your correction. Help us to be encouraged to drink deeply each day because you will provide whatever we need to face the day ahead. Thank you for Habakkuk and his life and his story. And this morning we honour you, Lord, and we love you. Amen. shepherd I shall not want in green pastures he makes me lie down he restores my soul and leads me on for his name for his great name I'll trust you, Lord.